All right. Hello, everyone. FBC, Full Band Capture and Troubleshooting Impairments. That's our type. That's our topic today. I'm Brady Volp, founder of Nimble This and the Volp Firm. Welcome back, everyone, to Get Your Tech On, our show on all things DOCSIS. This is episode 83. Back with us today is John Downey, Senior Technical Leader at Cisco Systems. John, welcome back. How are you doing? Doing well. I, I need to come up with a founder myself. Founder of, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll come up with a tagline. You can make up your title, whatever you want to be. John would like you. <laughs> so we're glad to have you with us. John, we're going to be talking about full band capture, troubleshooting, and uh, and a document that is coming out very soon from Cable Labs and SCTE, a subsidiary of Cable Labs, a document called um, Understanding Cable RF Spectrum. So this document I'm really excited about. We've been working for it on it for some time. I not so much as some others, but it's it's I, I did participate in it. It's a really exciting document. Um, we'll put it up on a screen here and we'll we'll get into it shortly. We're gonna get into it right away here. But John, I don't know if you've heard about this document, been participating in it. It is a Cable Labs document uh, or an SCTE document it falls under a working group, working group seven, number of people been on. One of the people is in our chat room today, Jason Roof. Jason, thanks for joining our chat room. Love to hear you some comments from you on it. So what this document is, uh, if we can get it up on a screen really quickly, just- I assume shows. Ron's involved too. Yeah, Ron right. Rannick's been involved, yes. a, a number of people. Um, so I, and many thanks to the folks that have been involved. Um, what the document is it, it really you know it, it, it we've created this document to help people understand not just full band capture and how it works but to understand all the you know when you see an impairment whether it's a suck out or a standing wave what causes that how do we troubleshoot it how do we understand it so we're going to dig into to some of these uh, some of these impairments and and really understand that i used to say it's like fingerprints you create a visual fingerprint of different problems and once you have that documented anyone can search it you know, instead of uh, all us old RF dogs keeping this information to ourselves and uh, and a lot of people retiring, uh, we need to have all this documented, which is a good thing. That's such a good point, John. And I think that's what we we try to do, you know, put that into the essence of this document is all that tribal information that some of us have in our minds. And, and we went out to a lot of other people to pull this information together and say, you know, when you have this type of problem, what's causing it? And, and that is really important to have, because as you said, you know, the, we have new people coming into the industry. They've not been exposed to this before. And so how does this information get passed down? Most of the time it's by word of mouth because we don't have like a good college or something like that to get this information. This document is so awesome. So I want to say it's not quite ab available yet. It's still going through that process of getting approved. If your company is part of the Cable Labs Standards organ Organization, I, you know, and I recommend everyone get involved in Cable Labs Standards. Definitely everyone, or not Cable Labs Standards, um, SCTE Standards Working Group, or um, you can get early access to this document. If not, soon this document's gonna get um, available. So let's dive right into this. Um, I, wanna, I wanna, so you know, right here we can see the, it's SCTE Working Group 7. Right now, uh, the document title is Understanding cable rf spectrum it's it's title is op 208 r1 that's the the current rev of the document once this gets published and we'll it's going to get a little different uh, title name on it but um i have on the top here for people to see just a couple pages like once this document comes out or if you get early access to it through the sete standards working group kind of what you're going to see it's really rich content with graphics of showing spectrum analyzer shots show you know what you can see from cable modems and a lot of full band capture and it's not just you know showing hey here's a full game band capture of what you see but it's also in how to interpret full band capture and we can see on here just a couple of screenshots of showing you like you know here's an sc qualm channel here's an ofdm channel here's guard bands here's pilot channels so really you know if you're if you're an industry veteran some of this stuff is going to be like yeah i already understand that but when you're training someone new this is like really powerful training material that you can build into any training deck or you can just hand someone this document and it's written in a way that it, it's easy to understand and absorb the material so a lot of times I tell people like, yeah, you can get the Cable Labs 5 specification, read it, but you know, take your time because it's going to put you to sleep. This document is not written like a Cable Labs specification. This SCTE document is much easier to read and much easier 
to interpret, which I, I like so much. And here's an example of um, just like a screenshot that comes out of one of, of out of the document that I think can be really, really helpful for people uh, and, and something that you might not see in a lot of other documents. So this, this is an example of full band capture screenshot that I personally spent a lot of time with some of my colleagues trying to figure out. And what we're seeing in this full band capture screenshot, John, I don't know if you saw this anywhere, but we're seeing some really high level, it looks like they're channels that are sticking out of full band capture. We spent a lot of time in the field going to customers' houses and looking for, you know, where are these signals coming from? We pulled modems out, we, we pulled plan apart, and what we found out, this was actually just bad firmware in cable modems causing, you know, just bad data to come out. So, you know, hey, we got techs in the field trying to troubleshoot this. We got guys like me trying to troubleshoot this. And what the root cause was, it's just bad data coming back from full band capture in bad firmware. Solution is upgrade your firmware and you'll stop trying to troubleshoot ghosts in the network. Yeah, so, yeah I, I'm looking at it and and I you say ghost is a good word for it. And uh, if you looked at a couple of them, they look like harmonics almost like 250, 500, 750. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> if it really was a bad carrier at 250, the second harmonic would be at 500, third harmonic would be 750. But normally harmonics are just ghosts of a real signal and they usually step down and function, like step down and level. Yes. Yours are all the same level all the way across. And there's some other oddballs in there. So, yeah, I haven't seen that. But, yeah, that would be a, that would be a pain in the butt to try to troubleshoot. Oh, it was a real mm -hmm. head scratcher, right? Because we think, well, maybe there's something being injected in the head end. No, it wasn't coming from the head end. And then we thought, well, maybe there's something that's getting local pickup in the subscriber's house, like, you know, something from the drop, the off-air signals. No, mm -hmm. it wasn't coming from there because we're going off spectrum analyzers and antennas connected to spectrum analyzers. We're not seeing any of these signals. So I even had a colleague that, and I, and, and I thought, you know, this is maybe plausible that maybe, maybe, there's like, you know, hackers or a foreign country like implanting uh, code into our cable modems. And now they're using this to transmit signals back. And we had all kinds of theories that we were yeah. coming up with to explain this. And yeah, it's bad firmware. So even, you know, something like this is in that document to explain to people if you're seeing the signals. And I still see these signals using full band capture on custom plants today. So that's still out there. That is a, that is interesting. And I'm, I'm curious also about the working group seven. Um, Full bandwidth captures in the modems. The more modems we have in the field that support this, the more visibility we have of the entire plant. And we can get a better idea of what's going on in the plant by looking at clustering and things going on at different modems. <laughs> Hopefully modems are updated so you're not getting false information. But how do the test equipment vendors feel about this? Are they threatened or they're involved in it as well? And they should be involved in it as well. Absolutely. You know, I think most of the test equipment and vendors see this as a as just an enhancement and they adopt it because they're I, I see test equipment vendors using full band capture in a lot of the software applications because it becomes just an extension of their testing capabilities. So I, th yeah. I think that's awesome. Um, so hey, Larry, welcome to the chat room. Larry Wilcott, best document ever. Larry was a um, one of the prime contributors on this. Um, so and uh, Jason Roop as well. So thanks for joining guys in the chat. Um, so suckouts, suckouts are you know a very common impairment that we have. So this is coming right out of the working group seven best this this document that we're talking out of, um, and and this is such rich com co content that we get in this document. So we see what a suckout is in the document. Um, in in the center, we can kind of see that suckout in the lower end of the spectrum frequency band. On the right hand side, we zoom in on that suckout, and we have some. We have some text, and this text comes right out of the document. It says, you know, a suck out is a type of standing wave most commonly seen as a single notch RF impairment that often spans multiple channels. Typically, suck outs are caused by mechanical or grounding issues in active or passive network elements such as seizures, connectors, lids, or fittings. They can be, a they can be attributable to multiple mismatches even evenly spaced throughout the network. Even mismatch adds to each mismatch adds to the width and depth of the notch at the frequency of the suck out. An example is the repetitive impedance discontin discontinuities created by the so-called mold spike in some disk dielectric cables. 
at the simpler level, a suck out is a result of an impedance mismatch. So I kind of covered multiple things there. I took pieces out the documents. So we're kind of showing one type of suck out here on the left hand side where there's an amplifier with sort of poor grounding on, on the bottom that can cause that suck out. And we'll see other examples of that. So poor grounding on an RF amplifiers we're seeing here, that can be one type of suck out. Um, and, and a suck out as we see here, you know, what's the impact on the end subscriber? Well, if the end subscriber is trying to, their set top box or their cable modem is trying to lock on to one of these low level channels in that suck out region, the set top box may get pixelization, may not even be able to lock on it, they'll just get a black channel. If it's DOCSIS, then their DOCSIS cable modem may not be able to lock onto those lower level channels and that'll cause issues with speed tests. So what's the, you know, what can, uh, what's a tech do? A lot of times a tech, they just may, you know, hit an amplifier. And when I mean hit it, they hit it with a hammer, a, a rubber mallet, and that will cause this corrosion on the bottom of the amplifier module to break up a little bit and that'll make the stuck out go you know just go away but that's not really the best solution because that's just a temporary thing what we normally recommend is you can pull out that amplifier and on this yeah it's not on the next side sorry that'll you know break it up if you pull out the amplifier there are some different ways that we can ideally you know get rid of the corrosion that might be underneath there um, there are some sprays that we can put on there's mechanical abrasion that we can get rid of it but I, ideally we would just want to clean that up john you remember back at c -Core, we used to have a sandblasting room we'd get these housings in and they would sandblast the housings they'd sandblast the modules ideally to get rid of that corrosion and eliminate the suck out so i would i would add to this that uh the lower frequency suck out is probably a grounding issue when you have an impedance mismatch that's every so often and it adds up, adds up because the signal is adding out of phase, it's reflecting and adding out of phase, which is creating a suck out because you're, you're subtracting the signal from the original signal because it's adding out of phase. And normally when you have an impedance mismatch every so often, let's say it's just a foot. Well, the distance of the impedance mismatch is inversely proportional to the frequency where the suck out is. So, the tighter the impedance mismatch, smaller, the higher in frequency the suck out will be. So many times, like you talked about times fiber, you didn't want to say times fiber cable in, in a working group, but we all know where, where, where it is. That fiber, that, that coax was put out with a known suck out because of the mold at like 1.2 gigahertz, but we never went past the gig, so no one cared. Well, now if we're going to go past the gig, we're going to see that suck out because we never looked past there, but now we are. Um, but it was well known. Um, so I would say that it, it's interesting because if I have a reflection at the higher frequency, there's more loss at higher frequency. So sometimes it's not as deep maybe as a suck out, um, whereas lower frequencies have less loss, but the lower frequency suck outs probably from grounding, not impedance mismatch. To, to be at a low frequency, the mismatch would have to be like hundreds of feet apart, right. every hundred feet or so. Whereas we're talking higher frequency suck out will be like inches apart, inches, yep. inch. There was one example, of, and Jim McNeil or one of those guys, I remember back in the day, says they had a roll of spool of cable coax that fell off the truck and flattened out one side of the spool. So as you unrolled it, that flat part was perfect intervals, probably the diameter or circumference of the spool, right? So it's like every three feet. So you take 492 times velocity propagation divided by three feet, you'd end up with where that suck out would be. Is that a feature? <laughs> <laughs> Bug feature, they are hand in hand. It's an enhancement <laughs> in the cable. So, so, th so this next one, this next suck out, um, so you, you kind of talk that it's almost like a craft type thing. You know, they, they, they drop the roll of cable so that it's craftsmanship, workmanship um, in, in the kind of a, a wrong way. This next one shows a suck out. This still is a grounding issue, getting back to your point on grounding issues, but it's not because of corrosion buildup. It's because um, the technician did not tighten down the amplifier module. So I, I, I want to I you know, really make it clear how important it is, and, and you know, we know this, John, from working at C-Core, everything in that module, in the 
in the amplifier housing itself, it's all based around grounding, right? And and if we did crazy things at C-Core with putting finger stock on to make sure those amplifiers were well grounded. So part of that, there's like four screws, four hold down screws in, in the module itself. And we need to make sure those hold down screws, all four of them are tightened down well. And what we see here in this picture, so first of all, on the left-hand side, we see there's a suck out. In the middle, we see that suck out's gone. Now, the reason that suck out is gone is on the right-hand side, we see circled, where that circle is, there's a screwdriver going down to the very last hold down screw that was not part, properly tightened. And as the technician tightens down, torques down that screw, the suck out magically goes away. But there's, there's an important thing that I also want to illustrate or highlight is you see right where that suck out is? Do you see that, that tone that's sticking out? What, what do you think that tone is? Is it the oscillation that's being created over? Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the AGC pilot tone. Oh, man. So the <laughs> suck out's right where the AGC is supposed to be? Exactly. So what do you think that causes? Sure. So if the AGC and an amplifier doesn't see it, it's going to jack its levels up by 3 dB, maybe as close as 5 to 6 dB on each amplifier. So then each amplifier jacks up, jacks up, jacks up. By the end of the line, you got so much distortion that uh, the, the end people at the end of the line have worse you know, results and performance. Right, you know, right. By the way, so that slide, I would change your, your text to say loose module screw. The text says loose seizure screw. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is totally different. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. Will be low and roll off. Yes, yes. Thanks, yeah. thanks for correcting me there, John. <laughs> but I, th I think the, the the importance of it is if you have a suck out that falls right where the pilot signal is, that could cause like a chain reaction if you don't have visibility using full band capture that you have a suck out there because now you're going to see, as you said, your your levels on your amplifiers are going to move around, so you're going to go out and maybe start rebalancing your plant because of something that's happening due to a suck out. So full band capture is really cool because it gives us that visibility of why did our levels start moving around? Oh, because of a suck out in the plant. So we want right. to fix the suck out and not rebalance our plant. And I think that's some of the cool things that full band capture has that, that we can do. And oh yeah, thank you, Jason. That's like the, that's like the, pit, <laughs> the pitfall. That's like the pitfall of relying on one single channel to dictate the levels of your entire plant in the amplifier, right? That's how it's always been. The AGC ALC looks at one channel to make its decision for the rest of the channels. Yes. And if you lose that one channel, you know, it's it's bad news. So so Jason does bring up the, the comment. I, I have to say there was a lot of fun when you get into writing these documents and you start talking about what, how do you talk about a suck out? What do you call a suck out? And Jason <laughs> brings up truck out. There's a lot of fun that goes into the background of writing these documents. So we had a lot of fun. We started talking about suck outs and pull outs. So I would encourage, you know, kind of encourage people to not just read these documents, but really encourage people to get involved in the process of, of the documentation writing. It's a lot of fun. It really is. We had so much fun writing these documents. So I want to say there's, there's, Fun. You learn a lot. Uh, you get to contribute, and you can have fun um, in the in the writing of these documents. So everyone, fun, get involved. Fun relative. It might be fun for you, but <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you you get to participate. You get involved. Um, so I I want to pull up uh, this next slide here. There's there's actually kind of a cool thing. So you can think. You know, so far we talked about like suckouts on a single modem. A lot of times, these are outside plant problems. So you have to think about the fact that if it's impacting one modem, it's impacting multiple modems. And I just wanted to show here that when you start to apply, like a lot of us in the PNM Proactive Network Maintenance Arena, we're, we apply machine learning here. And here's it. so this is a low frequency suck out, as you're indicating before, um, John. But notice that it's impacting 134 subscribers if you look in the upper right hand corner. And that's actually something really important to consider when like imagine you get a call from a from a single subscriber that's saying, hey, I'm having issues with video or I'm having issues with Doxis. And we pull that up in our monitoring system. You see, yeah, they that single subscriber is having a suck out. Where do I send the technician? immediately, you know, we're very reactive in cable. So we send a technician right to that subscriber's home. This is where the power of our tools and, and using things like machine learning or even an algorithm to get you to that point is sending a technician to that single subscriber's home 
you're off, oftentimes never going to fix a suck out in a subscriber's home um, unless that, you know, unless it's just equipment in the subscriber's home. So where we're getting in the industry right now with machine learning and being able to utilize this capability is really exciting because now we can pull up a tool and say, do I send the technician to that subscriber's home who's calling or do I have a plan issue? And, and a lot of times we're seeing like suck outs, standing ways, some of these issues we're talking about are actually more in the outside plant. And we're just wasting time and annoying the subscribers by you know, sending a technician to a subscriber with a suck out when we actually know it's an outside plant issue and sending a technician to maybe that line extender or that amplifier. In this case, it looks like it's it's every subscriber on that fiber node. So it's probably something more towards the fiber node that's causing that suck out. So this gets really powerful and kind of exciting, at least from my perspective, where we can really start making more optimizations at the plan and optimizations where we send our technicians and stop annoying subscribers to fix these issues. Yeah, I mean, we so. should be able to see a clustering of the same type of issue and then find the common point. Yep. And that, and that's, that's where machine learning, I think really, really starts to help us in, in what we're doing. So, um, Definitely, if you're liking this content, please hit subscribe and hit the notification bell. You get notified next time we're doing it. Give us a thumbs up. That really helps. Thanks, everyone. Um, FM ingress. So this is another thing that is, I think everyone should be aware of FM ingress. I, I, I know we always talk about this a lot, but if you see FM ingress in your full band capture signal, we don't transport FM ingress on our cable plants. So how's it getting into our subscriber's house? Well, it's normally getting in by bad wiring. And, and this picture, again, comes right out of the this Working Group 7 document. It shows, you know, well, we, we customers do crazy things in our houses. We have lots of connections and opportunities for FM ingress to, to come in. And this is a prime example here where we had some bad uh, connectors, lots of FM ingress coming in. That gives the opportunity for other bad signals to get into the downstream. We see here we have some UHF signals getting in, some LTE ingress getting in. Those are going to cause problems on the subscribers downstream, give them issues on their video, give them issues on their doxes. But if you have downstream signals getting in, there's also a good chance that you're going to have upstream signals getting in. So this subscriber is not only going to have downstream issues, but this subscriber is also going to be a, a, a subscriber that's going to allow return path ingress into our plan. Every cable operator is constantly battling return path ingress. So this, this FM ingress indicator is going to tell us this is a good opportunity. If we can fix our downstream issues, we're also going to be cleaning up return path issues. So cleaning up in subscriber wiring, in-home wiring, and their drop is going to help us re clean up our return. Well, ironically enough, that FM ingress will be upstream if we ever go to 204. Yes. So if we go to 204 upstream, then the FM radio ingress is going to hit our upstream, and that's going to be a problem. Yeah, and I think for but, many subscribers, it's yeah. not if, it's when we go to 204 yeah. megahertz. So, I mean, taking care of it now or documenting the houses that have potential issues, uh, it'd be nice to know that before you go out there and upgrade to a 204, you know? You're like, you know, uh, this guy had ingress at, at the 88 to 108, and we just kind of turned a blind eye to it because it's not affecting anything at this point. But now that I'm going to 204 at this house, I better take care of it when I go there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Something of that nature. Yes. So this next one is a flashback for you, John, and it is a C core amplifier showing resonant peaking. Get this slide up. Um, so our old, our old Mamater C core, um, res so, so resonant peaking is, it's kind of like the opposite of a suck out, but just goes back to the grounding issues. And we can see it, um, in the bottom, of this C core amplifier, uh, hopefully it comes through on the video okay, but you can see there's some gray shading in the bottom of the, the amplifier module housing here, the bottom of the housing itself. And that gray shading is just an indication that there's been some corrosion in the bottom here. So obviously some, some moisture has gotten in the bottom of the amplifier, we have corrosion. That corrosion is going to come back and cause grounding issues that we've talked about. So, so we have poor grounding now where the module seats down into the amplifier housing. And, and anytime we have grounding issues, now we're going to have, you know, we, we have that, we have the possibility to have suck outs, but now we also have the possibility to have something called 
resin peaking. So resin peaking is basically amplification in areas where we don't have, want to have amplification. And as we see on the right-hand side in our full band capture spectrum area, um, instead of it being ideally flat, we can see in the area that there's a little bit of gray in the spectra column, the signal kind of goes up. And where that signal is going up, that's what we call resonant peaking. So in, in the suckout case, the signal goes down. We have sort of a valley. In resonant peaking, it's the opposite of a suckout, right? The, we have a gain situation. And in the gain situation, that's you know kind of the opposite of suckout. Signals go up. So in, in the suckout case, we can have suckouts in passive devices as well as amplification devices in our amplifiers and our fiber nodes. Resonant peaking, on the other hand, it's only going to happen in amplifiers and fiber nodes because we need gain. We need that amplification, and we also need the poor grounding or degraded grounding, which we have in, in this C-Core amplifier here. It doesn't happen in just C-Core amplifiers. It can happen in, in any amplifiers, gain makers, etc., things like that. So it's the same situation here. You can, you can resolve this by pulling the module out and reseeding the module. Ideally, you'd want to clean out the corrosion that's on the bottom of the module there. Different ways you can do that. Problem with, you know, so what, what's the impact going to be on the subscriber here? Where that signal goes up, you're going to have too much signal, too much gain, and, and where the signal's not going up, you're going to have too low of gain. So you, you're going to have pixelization on your video channels. And if it's a DOCSIS modem trying to lock on that, you may not be able to lock on those channels. Um, and also, if you remember, this looks like it's very close to the pilot channel again. So what we talked about before with the suck out, with resonant peaking, if this is on your ALC or your AGC, this is going to cause your signal levels to go up and down. Really problematic. So oh, uh, if it's one's called a suck out, the opposite would be a suck up <laughs> or a suck in. Yeah, you should have been on this working. You should be on this working group with us. You add lots of entertainment. <laughs> so I got three examples of this oscillation occurred, and and when I was at Secor, at least two of them occurred, maybe three. One was uh, going from a one way amplifier to a two way amplifier by putting a diplex motor, forgetting to cut the little jumper and plugging it right on top of the jumper. So the signal is oscillating within the diplex filter. So a very short distance. Smaller distance means higher frequency. So you might see an oscillation at the higher end. Now, another oscillation could be you are fusing in and out of the amplifier. So you have a path for the reverse path to go from low side diplex filter, low side diplex filter, but then go through the RF coil, the RF choke, through the in and out fuse and create a circle or circular oscillation between that path, the power path and the RF reverse path. That was usually right around two megahertz or so. And then we had another one where someone would go from maybe um, upgrading their own reverse path because it was, a, it was a passive reverse. So they upgraded and put a reverse hybrid in and that hybrid was more than what that amplifier was calling for. So now your reverse gain is higher than the total losses between the upstream and downstream path, and the signal is looping between the high and low. So normally you have low pass filters. On the high side, you have a high pass filter. Diplex filter, you have isolation or rejection. Uh, if that doesn't have enough, the gain is more than the loss in that path, it'll run away oscillation. So that's another case. So there's three cases where you have to look at the block diagram and see is there a path where the signal can kind of bleed across and just run, get out of control? Yeah, so on the uh, C-Core 860 amplifiers, I was just reminded at a recent training that I was doing about the oscillation issues with the, C with the 860 amplifiers. And, I, and I, it goes back to the point that you were just saying. We, we added, I think it was 15 amp power passing capabilities in the 860 amplifiers. We did that by putting AC wires on the bottom, and that created exactly the oscillation from the input to the output that you're referring to. Um, have you seen that same issue on other manufacturer amplifiers, or, or are you talking specific to the C-Core 860s? Because that, uh, that was the biggest one that I has, have seen that problem with. Oh, I think we lost you, John. Um, well, we're waiting for you to come back. Larry, I, I saw your comment you on John saying spot and on on the lost, fm amplifiers was, yeah, <laughs> John, we lost you for a second so i lost you for a second that's all right, all right. it's the inner tubes <laughs> <laughs> and i and i have fiber to the home 
<laughs> so, I don't know what to say. But uh, yeah, I did see that on the, the Cisco because I was there at the time. And I remember one of the workouts we made was a, uh, a filter on a SPB or a, a Pi a Pi pad, mm -hmm. uh, an attenuator that we would put into, say, the reverse path to create more attenuation in the reverse path on right. purpose. Because we couldn't afford to change out the RF chokes. You can't change the coils. Yep. I mean, they're all soldered in. So we just need to add a little bit more attenuation uh, in the path before it bled back over to the high side and come back around again. Yeah, I, I would say I, it, it seems it's pretty com it's pretty common that RF amplifiers are designed so they're always right at this cusp of going into oscillation. I mean, that's that's the trade off of getting the the amount of output out of RF amplifiers. So I think that's a pretty common industry thing that we run into. Um, all right, so next slide. So we get in now. I, I think uh, so. Larry's on here. It's probably two of his favorite topics to talk about is standing waves. So, you know, we, we get standing waves. Um, they're, they're indicative of RF impairments that will basically impact the entire spectrum. Uh, plan impairments are most often caused by, again, impedance mismatches, one of our favorite things, going back to micro reflections between the node and the modem. Um, in the downstream, when we see um, when they're, they're seen by a cable modem, energies reflects off the second impairment back to the first, and then some of that energy continues upstream, but it's delayed, causing an impact to the signal. It appears as a standing wave in the data spectrum. So what I like so much about this, and again, this is coming right out of the Working Group 7 document, the top standing wave is what we typically see by classic um, mi impedance mismatches in the cable plant. The bottom standing wave the by, com, comparing, and contrasting, comparing and contrasting these two is really, really important because the bottom standing wave, notice it's not periodic, whereas the top standing wave is periodic. So the top standing wave by periodic, I, I mean, these, you know, there's very, con, very consistent um, spacing nice. between every single sine wave that you see on there. The bottom standing wave is air per aperiodic, and and I know we covered this last time when we had Larry on here, and he went into all of his water wave uh, discussions. It was great podcast. Um, by aperiodic on the bottom, there's it's just not consistent by what we see between every period of that sinusoidal wave. So we know in the bottom we're seeing there's water in the coax cable, and that's been a really great discovery that um, Larry and his team at Comcast we made because now we know that there is a difference between standing waves. And when we see that bottom standing wave, we know we can start looking for water. And this paper goes into great detail about you know, how the differences between the two of these. And that's an awesome discovery we've made in the industry now because we know when there's water in our coax cable and when there's not water in our coax cable. That's something that's really important and we're starting to in include in all of our PNM, our proactive applications. And one of the one of the last times we did talk about FPC, I also brought up when I worked at WaveSec, uh, which then turned to JDSU, Briavi, and all those Acterna. Uh, we had an impedance a return loss issue on the test equipment at higher frequencies. And when you hooked up your test lead to a 20 dB down test point, there's more signal coming out of that test point than a 25 dB down test point. So there's more signal coming out it would hit the front end of the test equipment and have not a really great return loss at the higher frequency and reflect back and forth. And the test point didn't have a good return loss either. So the standing wave was only at the higher frequency and the separation in the sine waves and the peaks and valleys, you do the math and it ended up being exactly three foot long or what three meter or whatever the size of your test lead was. So it turned out it wasn't the plan at all it was actually the device under test or it was my test equipment itself. And then we came out with this, this uh, test lead with a 6 dB pad on it and some voltage blocking capacitors in case you probe seizure screws and had AC on it. You wouldn't want to fry the front end of that pad. Um, but yeah, that was enough to, like 6 dB pad gives you 12 dB more loss to the reflection, right? It makes mm -hmm. your return loss look much better. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, another one of those head scratchers. You're like, oh, something's going on in my plant. It turns out you're the one creating the problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen the enemy and he is us. 
<laughs> All right. Um, so traps. So John, I think we were talking about traps um, before this this started. We see traps in the plant all the time. Customers use them, um, and then they forget that they're out there. And it's, so we can use full band capture to see if customers have traps, how they're working. The example that we have here is Arcom. We love Arcom. They make these great little filters that allow us to have data only customers. They don't want the video. They want the data only. We put the trap in, make sure we don't get them. A lot of customers, a lot of operators are moving away from traps because we can, we can, you know, filter out video using other methods. Um, but finding those traps once that are been put in the plant can be difficult at times. We also see traps can go bad. If they get a surge strike, then they can cause issues. And, and you talked about that earlier. So I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you recap what you talked about with traps. So the other the problem with traps, it's problematic is, uh, if someone says, I just want data, but then we go to Docsis 3.1 and the MSO wants a place to OFDM, OFDM at the low end where the video used to be. So now it's, uh, I just want data, but my data is 3.1 and I need to take the trap off anyway. So that becomes a problem. So traps need to go away. Um, I have a customer that is trying in their Euro Docsis up to 65 megahertz upstream. And they're trying to run a single carrier qualm at 45 megahertz. And they're seeing consistently across multiple CMTSs and line cards and nodes, uh, low SNR, which we also call MER. So that low MER, we thought, well, is it the CMTS? Is it bad timing? Nothing shows up on a spectrum analyzer. So CNR looks fine, but timing won't show up on a spectrum analyzer. Uh, you don't know if there's something underneath of it, but zero span mode of spectrum analyzer, you would see it because it's bursty in the upstream. Uh, this was nothing apparent but the MER and SNR looks bad. So obviously it's a bad constellation. Um, and it's one of the reasons I try to discourage single carrier qualm above 40 anyway, because there's so many traps and filters and things out there that cut off at 40 or 42. So it creates group delay, it causes issues. Um, and even if they're a 65 megahertz system in a plant, you can't guarantee every household is not having a, a, a tap or a house amp. It could be an, an expat from the US living in the UK and they brought their own house amplifier for electronics or whoever. Uh, Electroline, you know, is one of the house amps. It's downstream, but it has a diplex filter in it, and maybe it's 42 megahertz. Yes. So now that thing is causing roll off, and you're trying to run a single carrier qualm at 45 megahertz, and maybe it gets through because pre equalization in the modem compensates a little bit, but now it has poor MER. So, um, well, I'm curious how widespread that. this problem is for this operator. So it was, um, at the time, they said it was like multi, like 10 different CMTSs or 10 different line cards, oh. 10 different nodes. Said, well, you know, when it starts showing up in multiple places, it's probably not software and it's probably not the line card because multiple line cards. Uh, it's probably the plant. Um, but at 45 megahertz, I also get concerned about, you know, remember video, analog video IF is between 41 and 47 megahertz. So how do I know this isn't an isolation issue or a bleed over where the motor is trying to transmit at 45 and it's bleeding over to say a set top box or an old TV set and coming back. So now you only see the problem when that modem transmits. Okay, that IF interference would directly interfere with a modem. So it would, and we've, we've seen that before. We know that if there's enough interference, it'll actually interfere with the modem pre-equalizer taps and it, that'll degrade the MER itself. So it could just be a low level signal looking like impulse noise or interference. Yeah. The easiest thing might be either avoid it, or maybe if they do OFDMA, they can run a uh, an override zone where they run lower modulation, or they just say let profile management take care of it. So any modems that do have the issue, the modem will downgrade its its IUC to a different modulation. Correct. All right. So we have uh, fun stuff happening in the chat room. Larry and Jason, you guys are actually killing it with your funny jokes J if, if, if any, never, anyone has not experienced jason roop's sense of humor it's a fun time <laughs> so yes jason the first step to avoiding a trap is to know it's, it's existence thank you not easy fun <laughs> fun times jason um so next we're going to talk about adjacencies and you know i really have never given jason adjacencies um, much concern because I always tell, especially technicians, it's something you can only fix in the head end. So adjacencies is when you have two channels that, that are 
significantly have a significant delta in power from one another. We can see on from a full band capture standpoint. Here we have you know basically two SC qualm channels that have a, a pretty big delta between them. Normally we consider that delta when it gets to be 3 dB or higher, that's when it becomes problematic. And typically that the problem that the subscriber is going to experience is on that lower channel, the one to the left, set top boxes will have a problem locking onto that channel. Modems will have a problem locking onto that channel. And again, it's a head and combining issue where when, when we combine these two different blocks of channels together, we didn't do it optimally. There's maybe a pad padding was wrong or maybe a splitter's going bad, etc. Recently, though, when and the reason I said I didn't really give it too much con, um, thought before is I, I didn't think it was that problematic. Recently, um, all the way from tier one to tier three operators, as we've started to apply machine learning, we started to see a lot of adjacency issues that that adjacency is greater than 3 dB. Um, so I've, I've started to see cable operators say that well, this is actually a problem that is actually more problematic than we thought it was. Um, so I just want to throw that out there and, and say, you know, we're seeing adjacency be, being a greater and greater issue. And I don't know if that's because operators are starting to add more and more channels and, and change things up and add OFDM. John, I don't know if this is something you've seen to be more problematic or not. Well, I got two things here, two comments. One, adjacent Cs. I know there's adjacent root joke in there somewhere. Adjacent <laughs> Cs what? What the adjacent Cs everything. Adjacent root got this. <laughs> adjacent adjacent root Cs. Yeah, he, he was already on it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the other thing would be, be aware that when you look at a spectrum analyzer, you are looking at the adjacent channels and they are the same width. So everything's apples apples, but don't be confused by seeing narrower carriers higher than a wider carrier because the spectrum analyzer is not showing you digital average power. So a, a 1.6 megahertz wide carrier, say you have a, a pilot tone or something like that, it should look much it look much higher than a six megahertz wide single carrier qualm because of how spectrum analyzer displays reference levels and it doesn't display digital power uh, unless you actually tell it to. If you're just looking at a visual spectrum analyzer, it's just frequency versus amplitude. The, the levels based on the resolution bandwidth filter that happens to be configured on the box. So it could be so, throwing people off if they don't have a yes, spectrum analyzer yeah. set up. You could correctly. say, hey, I have an adjacency issue, but in reality, it's supposed to be like that. Right. Like a, my narrow carrier might need to appear 10 dB higher than my wider carrier, but they're actually the same power levels. Right. Hey, and I, and I want to I want to point out here. Uh, Larry corrected me. It's uh, actually very good valid point he made. Not 100 percent are adjacency issues in the head end. Uh, they they could occasionally be at a local assertion point, a hub site, something like that, where you're you're putting in local. Uh, local program injection. So, Larry, thank you. Thank you for correcting me on that. Um, Jason, thank you also. Very common. It can be uh, impactful as well, um, the adjacency issues. So, um, and some of it might be on purpose, right? You might run your OFDM 3 dB higher than your single carrier qualm on purpose. I, I actually see a lot of cable operators that also choose to run their SC qualm doxes channels um you know maybe three or 60 be higher than their video channels i'm not saying that that is recommended i just see cable operators with a choose to run doxes channels a little higher to ensure um from their perspective that they're they're Many operating the, well the, the problem of what uh, tcp total composite power Correct. right and now you got to worry about distortions and stuff like that it can it can Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a word of caution as you're going Fine there, line. John. It can cause line. other issues. Yeah. So a um, couple more here. So roll. So we can see roll off um, very, very, very well with full band captures. And there's a number of issues, as we all know, that will cause water. Um, you know, one can just be filters in there. We can in, have improperly balanced our amplifiers, um, improper alignment in our amplifiers, and of course, water. So, you know, we know that water impacts higher frequencies more than it impacts lower frequencies. And this next slide, I just want to throw in, um, particularly if we get water in our passive devices, um, so, so that will definitely cause high frequency roll off. And this is such a great example that comes from, again, our the 
the document that we're talking about. It's going to be released very soon. I cannot wait till it comes out publicly. Um, so water corrosion in a tap, such a great example here. You pull the tap apart. You may not have water in there when you pull it apart, but there's always going to be evidence. So we can see, you know, as it's identified there, there's some, looks like some corrosion or even rust on that screw there. So if you're out in the field and you happen to be pulling a tap apart and you see evidence of water in there, I strongly recommend just don't pull, put that tap back in, that tap faceplate. That water is likely leaking in because the rubber gasket or the, the um, metal impregnated gasket around that tap face plate is either missing or has become compromised. And you should find another tap face plate and maybe even the tap housing to replace it if uh, that's damaged because things do not get better over time in our cable plant, folks. They just get worse. So take the opportunity and make it right. So, Larry, uh, got some more information here for us. Uh, it's not all in your head. FCC has a spec, just saying. And uh, come on. <laughs> Jason, your sense of humor is always there. Thank you. John, anything on uh, water in passives? Uh, it's, a... it's bad. And, and I, <laughs> it's all and water we... under the bridge? Yeah. <laughs> water on my knee. Uh, <laughs> um, to, I... And I don't know how true this is. I'm sure Ron or someone will correct me. I don't believe that uh, water by itself, like distilled water, is conductive. It's when not, you get it's that not water, conductive. It is not. It's, distilled know, water is not conductive. When you get the water in a tap and you start getting corrosion of aluminum and all that, then that water becomes conductive mm -hmm. and the higher frequencies find that path to ground. And that's why the higher frequencies roll off because they're being grounded instead of passing through they're going to ground through yes. the water yeah, but the but... lower frequencies are not it's not uh resistive enough at lower frequencies to go to ground so it still passes through you know what i mean through the center conductor instead of jumping over through the water to the ground well yeah well, lower frequencies are are much more immune to water uh, but they're much more susceptible to, as you say, low frequency or high frequencies can't swim, and and low frequencies. But but can't and, and what's funny about this? What's funny about this too is, think about one of the lowest frequencies we run on the plant. AC power, sixty hertz. It ironically will definitely go to ground and mm -hmm. short the ground with water in a power passing tap and another uh byproduct instead of just high and roll off on rf you might notice more current draw off on your mainline power supply right because you're basically shorting out electricity and you were that's going where with that <laughs> that's another added bonus that's another added bonus <laughs> you're paying more money you're paying more money for power that's actually just seeping into the ground yes <laughs> all right Final slide up is, um, you know, another thing we can see with full band capture is, is the overall RF power level going into our cable modems. So that's helpful because we can tell which subscribers have two, maybe a loose connector on the back of the cable modem. And it also gives us the ability to see intermittent cable connections on the back of the cable modem because what we're seeing here is actually a cable modem that's fluctuating a lot over time uh, so variability in that receive level at the back of the cable modem what's remarkable here is this cable modem even though you, it's bin level or it's receive level is incredibly low it's was still able to transmit back via snmp its full band capture data so we're actually able to see how low the signals are coming into the cable modem. We're able to look at it over time and see if every scan, this level is actually jumping to a higher level and then a lower level, and a higher level and a lower level. What the actual root cause was is that connector on the back of the cable modem was actually loose. So lower signals were doing okay. Higher signals were attenuated much more. So I look at your, your Y axis there. Why? I assume that's like a reference level minus 20, minus 15, minus 12. That's and it just like a spectrum analyzer, that's probably not corrected for six megahertz wide, right? Yeah, the gray bars are corrected. 
to the true power. So the, okay. the true power in DBMV is right around okay. minus 20, just, just shy of minus 20 at the yeah. higher frequencies. And normally you would lose lock on your primary downstream if it was like the specs is minus 15. I like my downstream between minus five and plus five to be safe. Correct. But yeah, I've seen modems work down to minus 15, minus 18, whatever. But as soon as I lose downstream lock, you're gonna lose all connectivity and then you lose FPC. And, and this modem was right on that threshold of just being able to yeah. send back FPC at the minus 18 and minus 20. And the other good thing is you would just see this very isolated and targeted to the one house and not multiple houses, yep. unless they all have the same problem. Yeah, and we can see- Same, that. same so, technician, same technician <laughs> didn't tighten them all up as he went through the, the neighborhood. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> and, and, and Larry uh, just said FM ingress is a very common result of a loose connector. And we saw that there was FM ingress on this. There was also a, some high frequency signals that were probably like LTE or something that were leaking in at the same time. So we were capturing all kinds of stuff off of this uh, modem as well. So good call on that one, Larry. All right, so that was what I had to cover today. I do want to remind everyone um, just one more time that uh, this document uh, is is something that is coming out soon. It's not yet released. If you are a cable or a SCTE working group member, you can get this document now, early release uh, for working group seven, and download it. Highly recommend it because we we just covered a really just a few pieces of information on this document it is a fantastic document it um the document itself is uh 73 pages long of fantastic con content it is in the review process now to be coming out I, I can't tell you exactly the time it's gonna be coming out hopefully not too long as soon as it does come out i'll try my best to remember to come back and put put a link into the comments of this video and that way everyone will be able to get it as they see this video later on. Please try to remember me. If I don't, someone ping me and say, hey, you didn't put the link back in here once it's out. Um, so we'll get that out there. So it's a fantastic video. And I wanna thank everyone who contributed on that. A couple of the authors are on here today, Jason Roop, Larry Wilcott. We already said Ron Rannick was on here. Um, can't remember all the authors that were on here, but uh, there's a lot of great authors on the, on the document great information and i do encourage everyone um get it now or get it when it comes out this will be valuable for every cable operator out there to disseminate to their employees and and read this because of great information so um upcoming events john sct expo 2020 is going to be live in philly september 19th to 20 uh to the 22nd so I'll be presenting two papers there, one on the top five things you should know about uh, operating a virtual CMTS. And then I'm also co-authoring a paper that Ron Rannick will be presenting uh, on how proactive network maintenance will change under DOCSIS 4.0. So uh, definitely check those out. John, I think you're going to be going. You're Hopefully you're going. Yep. I didn't submit any papers. Um... But I plan to be there. I don't know at what capacity. Uh, hopefully, I'll have more time to actually walk around uh, than I used to in the past. It'll be nice to go back to a live one again. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, Philadelphia in September should be okay. <laughs> It'll be a great <laughs> time. We'll be back it to the other game. game. It might be an Eagles game by then. Actually, the football season's just starting up too, right? Right around uh, September 5th or Labor Day or Labor Day weekend. I think it's just going to be great to get back and see everyone face to face again. So I'm pretty sure we'll be face to face this year. Um, Jason and Larry, thanks for all the uh, chat in the, in the chat room. Thanks everyone for watching. Um, love to have everyone drop a comment in in the uh, in the YouTube chat if you have any questions on full band capture. Be glad to answer them the best we can and definitely keep an eye out for when this great document we talked about is released. Thanks everyone for watching. We appreciate your time. John, thank you for all the great input. So long and we'll be back soon. Take care guys. Have a good 4th of July for the US yes. people. <laughs>